And here's the most exciting thing to me. This is the part that really applies to the concept of health and wellness and understanding the Randy Johnson story. <laughs> I'm getting back to that story. <laughs> we actually seem to have an area in our brain which allows us to have these experiences. You don't have to wait until you die to have this experience. The scientific research clearly documents that every single person here will have this experience. No question about it. You can't believe the questions people ask me. Well, will Hitler have? Of course, Hitler's a human being. When Hitler dies, he'll encounter a spiritual light. Well, what about Saddam Hussein? In Saddam Hussein's memoirs is a very beautiful near-death experience, interestingly enough. Um, I love Raymond Moody. He kind of likes to have fun with audiences, as, as you can tell I do. And so Raymond Moody, when people ask him, well, what's the most moving experience you've ever heard? He tells them Saddam Hussein's experience, um, just to give them a little tweak. Because, see, we have all this moral overlay. Well, you know, good people must have it, or maybe good people just have the good one and bad people have the bad one. Absolutely not. You die the life you live. Who has hellish experiences? Not bad people. People who live in the Bible Belt. People who believe in hell. People who hell is part of their personal mythology. The best collection of hellish near-death experiences comes from Nashville, Tennessee, collected, uh, well, at the heart of the Bible Belt, where there's many people who have a deep belief in a real hell. And uh, there's um, the, a Tennessee cardiologist, Maurice Rawlings, has written extensively about this. I don't find that uh, surprising at all, at all. No different than I found, it's, uh, I wasn't surprised that people in Africa had African near-death experiences filled with African mythology, filled with an African interpretation. Interestingly enough, in Africa, many people did not perceive the experience to be pleasant at all. They thought that they were bewitched. They thought that there was something wrong, that they were still conscious when they were dying. All of that is the cultural clutter, and that's what you have to push away. What, what you need to know is that we have a large area of our brain which is clearly responsible for allowing us to have this experience and this experience involves a communication with something that most people call God and that it's absolutely physically and spiritually healthy to have that type of communication. Well, what is this area of the brain? This is our right temporal lobe, an area of the brain as large as the area of the brain which allows us to have language, which is our left temporal lobe. So this, we're talking about a huge hunk of neuronal machinery. I don't believe that we evolved that huge hunk of neuronal machinery simply to generate a pleasing dissociative fantasy at the point of death. I think if you come across a television set in somebody's home, it's proper to infer at least that that television set is meant to receive signals from some sort of transmitter. Well, that's what we apparently have in our brain. And here is it. This is uh, our right temporal lobe. This is from the research done by Wilder Penfield, the father of modern neurosurgery, hardly a pseudoscientist. He stimulated areas in this brain here at those points one, three, and five in which patients said things like, oh God, I'm out of my body. Or even more tantalizing, I'm half in and I'm half out. Furthermore, all of the elements of the near-death experience, with the exception of the encounter with that spiritual light, are well documented by his electrical stimulation studies of the right temporal lobe. And, and that's not the only such research. Um, one of the best ways to understand the brain is by understanding brain pathology. People who have right temporal lobe seizures frequently think they're out of their physical body and having mystical experiences. Um, people who have brain tumors in that area frequently have it. Uh, you know, similar types of experiences. So it's quite obvious that these experiences are normal and natural and that each person has to interpret them according to their own personal psychology. I'm not suggesting these experiences are necessarily caused by the right temporal lobe. I, I don't know if there's a real God or not. I don't know. Um, so maybe they are. Uh, as I said earlier, it seems incredible that we would have evolved a huge hunk of our brain just to 
generate a pleasing lie when we die, <laughs> but nevertheless, um, since the use of that area of the brain obviously leads to good spiritual and physical health, maybe we did evolve it um, in such a way. And maybe a side effect of it is, is that, you know, I don't know. But nevertheless, another way of looking at it is from the work of Kurt Vonnegut. This is a science fiction writer, but I think it applies here. He says, everyone, this is written from the 21st century, everyone now knows how to find the meaning of life within in himself. But less than a century ago, men and women could not name even one of the 53 portals to the soul. So let me make sure that I'm being plain with you all. I want to I wanna make sure now that you've heard me clearly. Looking at this issue of near-death experiences teaches us that we have an area of the brain called our right temporal lobe which allows us to find the meaning of life for each one of us. The one message that I hear again and again from people who've had near-death experiences is that they learn that their lives are important and filled with meaning. So people who have had that area activated, that's what they get out of it. They don't get some grandiose, wonderful, Masonic desire to save the world. They don't. The average person has had a near-death experience. Let me give you an example. This guy says to me, um, well, I got kicked out of heaven. I told you about him earlier. And then I heard a voice saying, go back, Bobby. You've got a job to do. If I was earlier in this research and a lot more cynical about it, and I'm like, all righty, you know, let's hear what his job is. You know, save the world from cancer or, you know, what? So I said, all righty, what, I'll bite. What's your job? He says, I already told you my job. I'm a construction worker. I have 13 employees. You know, <laughs> I have three children. So he was kicked out of heaven to become a construction worker. <laughs> that's the meaning of his experience. And yet he was absolutely convinced that that's what he was supposed to do. Many don't know what the purpose is. Many will say to me things like, well, you know, maybe I'll interact with someone and they'll do something really meaningful. Another child told me that the whole meaning of her near-death experience, I interviewed her later when she's a, she's a teenager, she said, I don't mind waiting in line at grocery stores because I know that that's important. So this concept that our lives are important and filled with meaning and that we each have the ability to have spiritual intuitions and perceptions and integrate those perceptions into our ordinary lives, that to me is the meaning of the near-death experience. Now, I'm going to tell you what I mean by that. I want to explain this a little bit more. I think I have one more slide that shows this. Okay, so I've made that point. Okay. So here we go. I'm not talking about, you know, I just want to, you know, just to finish up on that. From the, I'm just talking about from any objective scientific review of, of what we know, look what we've learned from, by just taking an agnostic, non-philosophical viewpoint. These experiences are not psychopathology, they're not hallucinations, they really happen to people when they die, and they're normal. And there seems to be some sort of anatomical link with a large area of our brain. And uh, we get it, uh, this is what, so the psychological term for that sense of leaving your body and encountering God, psychologists call dissociation. And here's my last slide, but I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about what this slide means. See. Here's the hallmark of the valid near-death experience. If you want to know if somebody is really giving you a near-death experience, they, they started off by saying, you'll think I'm crazy, but this is what happened to me. That's because we have come to associate these experiences as being pathological. And we've forgotten that spiritual experiences are natural and normal. So near-death experience, in my mind, validates a wide range, since I work with death and death and dying, primarily I'm interested in more of the dying visions. Premonitions of death, after-death visitations. Over 20%, perhaps as much as 50% of the population, after someone they love dies, that person will come back to them and say, I'm all right. Stop crying for me. Sometimes it's even more prosaic. 
<laughs> I, a uh, guy, one of my neighbors said, I got to tell you one. He said, you're going to love this one. He says to me, um, his sister, her fiance was tragically ki killed uh, by the road up near where I live. And they were very close. And um, they, they weren't married um, yet. And furthermore, she had a son from another marriage. So she had become very close. Uh, you know, the, the, the boy had become very close to this, um, this fiancé who was then killed. This fiancé came back to discuss woodworking pro uh, projects with this young man. She didn't know anything about woodworking. He was fascinated by it. And so he said to her one day, oh, don't worry. Michael always comes and helps me. He, he tells me what to do. To get information, you know, to me, that's, a, a, you know, an aspect of these experiences which convinces me personally that they're real, by the way, that uh, there's a lot of information, uh, cases of information gained from, from such experiences. But that's a distraction. I'm not interested in proving whether these experiences are real. I'm more interested in learning that we can discover for ourselves if they're real just by tuning into our own intuitions and perceptions. So sure, I have lots of stories for you up at Vancouver Children's Hospital. Um, they called me about a girl that uh, she uh, nearly died, but she had uh, some pre-death visions. And in one of her pre-death visions, she said she went to heaven and that her playmate Jamie was there. And nobody knew that Jamie had, had died uh, previous. And then sure enough, once the parents investigated, they found out that this was part of a uh, sort of a cancer group. Um, and they, they tend to, you know, the same group same kids going through protocols get to know each other pretty well. And nobody had known that this other girl had previously died of cancer until, you know, uh, until, until it was revealed in this pre-death vision. So, if, you know, you can, you know, they, obviously you get information from these experiences. But the important thing for me is that people not dismiss or trivialize or ignore the experience. We, in the medical field, we call these after-death hallucinations. And yet, I believe by simply validating the experience and letting people know that they're real, they seem to be mediated by a part of the brain. I'll tell you what I tell people when they tell me, gosh, my husband died and now he's been coming back to me and I think I'm going crazy. I say, you're not crazy. Your right temporal lobe is working uh, naturally. You know, this normal. And that alone is enough to make people cry tears. That's a very healing thing to know that these experiences are normal, they're natural. I have a young man, he nearly died in a terrible car accident that his father was killed in. He told me that he went through a, a huge noodle to heaven. Then he says, well, it couldn't have been a noodle because I don't think noodles have a rainbow in them. It must have been a tunnel. <laughs> I love each experience. It's so odd. You know, you know it must be real. I mean, that's obviously not something he got from TV. I never heard of a noodle to heaven. <laughs> but, but he said to me, he said, but was it real, Dr. Morse? Was it real? Then his mother, before I could even answer, his mother says to me, and tell me if this is real. My husband has been coming back and talking to me. It was her husband was killed in the car accident. Yeah. And then she answered her own question. She said, I know it must be real because once I learned of my son's near-death experience, I knew it was happening to me. It is possible uh, that they can come back and communicate with us. Absolutely true. 